Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I am very thrilled to think that here at Illuminate, we can continue to explore the issues that are sometimes so personal that when we see the political, we become stifled. I am here today to encourage you through a few stories of those who have been unlawfully arrested at the state capitol in Georgia to explain why we believe that this era of Jim Crow 2.0 is more than just anecdotal, it is factual, and it is actually so important that we all rise up in opposition to the voting suppressive changes that we look at it as a form of trauma. I would like to express to you this idea of trauma-informed services in general. If you're a healthcare provider, you may know this just as well. If you are trained in trauma-informed practices, if you are doing an exam on your client and they flinch, if you are trained, you might know to say, okay, I will stop. Are you okay for me to continue? It's going to be a warm touch. It's going to be a cold touch, et cetera, like that. When you have individuals who are interfacing with government systems or systems at large that govern their lives, it is important that we have trauma-informed providers all across our communities. Many communities have started to work on harm reduction policies and bringing forward some of the most stigmatizing conversations to the policy table. Here in Georgia, over the past 10 years, we have seen that work be done over and over. And I want to express this idea of trauma-informed resources for the voting system that we believe made it possible to turn Georgia blue. That's right, she's blue, y'all. But it didn't start overnight. This started with years and years of intense negotiations, verbalizations, and implementations. One of those important ways that we have seen trauma-informed voting exist in Georgia's voting practices is through voters voting out their trauma. They might have seen a racist campaign ad and decided they wanted to make their voice heard in their rural county by voting the opposite way. They might have actually had their registration revoked, but were able to get through the red tape and get their registration back on track. Or perhaps they expressly saw a lawmaker who represented them vote in a way that changed the voting law. It was pretty simple here in Georgia. It was a straight party line vote. And so Georgians know exactly where their traumas lie. Additionally, there were organizations like New Georgia Project and um, the League of Women Voters and Georgia Stand Up, the numbers go on and on, the Coalition for the People's Agenda, led and centered by people of melanin, melanated experience, people with melanin, to say, we will address these different areas where trauma-informed practices could help. We set up hotlines and realized that those were a little too hot. So we had to start calling them warm lines. If you didn't quite know why you were calling in, but you just felt like your vote was being restricted, at a hotline, you might feel as though you need to have all of the information right there. But on our warm lines, we were able to just hear what people had to say, learn about their experiences and give them a warm way to reach back out when they knew their intense realizations. Additionally, we saw organizations pass out food and water. That's right, if you made the decision to go vote in Georgia this year, you face the global pandemic. We believe that no one should have to face a disease in order to cast their vote. Therefore, we started to bring together systems of mutual aid in which if you had a chair at a polling place and you used it until you got to the front line, but you were willing to leave that chair behind, as long as someone could come and use it, they could use it. We also had individuals handing out water and food in lines. Here in District 58, we were unsurprisingly seen around the country to have the longest line to vote in the United States back in June at Park Tavern. That was because of a late minute and last term polling place changes, meaning that there were a number of 
consolidations that happened without the voters being notified. One of their polling places had construction. The other had an electrical issue and the other stopped being ADA accessible. So when all of those polling places came together on that same day, we had to put together a task force. Between the months of June and um, November of last year, Fulton County, the state's largest county in Georgia, put together a task force that focused on these key areas and how we could in some ways provide harm reduction and root out some of the issues that were creating additional trauma to our voters. We focused on logistics and locations, which is why we saw our major sporting arena open up to allow for voting. We also looked at some of the policies and procedures written by the federal government when September 11th in 2001 took place in New York City. There were, of course, elections and that city needed to know how to be resilient. So the federal paperwork that was working for the elections then, it could still work now. We were in a state of emergency and in a high level of pandemic with our numbers going up and up. As we reached into these pockets, may I just express, the conversations were daunting. At times, negotiations seemed like they would never be reached, but we continue to focus on the cycle of ideation. Many of you may know, as the Stanford School of Design calls it, design thinking. The idea that if you are moving a viable product, you need iterations, you need feedback, and at the end of the day, it's all about the end user. We saw voters across Georgia who were traumatized to be our end users in our experience around turning Georgia blue. We didn't know that the process would be completed with this electoral cycle. And we are unsure where our progress will head as we have 98 pages of election law changes to address to the public. I do want to address March 25th, the day that I went to work and was unlawfully arrested and removed from the Georgia State Capitol. I will be brief to say, I wish that this would be the last time that an African-American female senator or representative in Georgia would be arrested for fighting for voting rights. But Georgia's history says the exact opposite. In 2018, when Stacey Abrams' election was undecided because of the person who oversaw their own election as Secretary of State and became governor, there was an uprising at the state capitol. An uprising is an opportunity for people to express and to be heard. And as legislators, it is our honor to represent them. Sometimes when we find ourselves in the middle of law enforcement officers who are additionally sworn to the constitution to protect the people, and we see ourselves as officers of that same constitution, we must face difficult decisions. That day, Senator Nakima Williams was unlawfully arrested she, as she handed me her cell phone behind her back and I reached out to her husband. I remember thinking, I wish this would never repeat. We called a press conference outside of the Fulton County Jail immediately and expressed our desire to have all 15 individuals arrested with that Senator released. We stayed there all of those hours until they were released and the work continued to express to voters how important their vote would be in the years to come. I was not expecting on March 25th to be arrested. I serve as the secretary of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus, as well as the secretary of the Atlanta delegation, two of the most high ranking caucuses in the state of Georgia. As I represent 78 members of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus every day, I stand representing 4.4 million Georgians. As the secretary of the Atlanta delegation, representing 12 members who represent the metro Atlanta area, where we all know the density of the state of Georgia is located in the metro Atlanta area. We represent 5 million Georgians. On that day, when we adjourned at 617 and heard unusually that the bill was being signed at 630, a few members walked downstairs as we headed to the parking garage. We knocked on the door lightly as we normally would to enter the governor's office for a bill signing. I have the bills I have the pins and I have the photos to prove we have all been at bill signings even this past year. 
But instead of facing normal chiefs of staff and policy members, officers of the law dragged me out of the state capitol, launching a nights long uh, uprising at the Fulton County Jail, followed by two weeks long of a criminal defense case. Today, I'm here to express to you that as long as the charges have been dropped, we are thrilled, but the taste in our mouth is soured by the fact that these 98 pages of laws are in effect today. We have elections here in Atlanta in two months and many individuals do not know. It is an absolute battle cry in the state of Georgia for us to realize how important it is that we support voters who are traumatized throughout these electoral cycles. Please do not divest from us. As much as we are proud to stand for corporate accountability, and I stood with those individuals in the baseball arena, as well as in the hospitality arena, entertainment, and service provision arena, that it is important that we hold corporations accountable for their work or lack thereof in protecting the right to vote. It's about more than just deciding that you want to speak up on Senate Bill 202. It's about creating election day as a holiday within your corporation and making sure that the right to vote is protected. Now, you know, I will be here. I recently turned 30 and don't plan on going anywhere. I'm just starting to shake up Georgia politics and hope that you'll remain on the trail with me as we keep knocking. Have a great day.